Hey everyone, in this video, let's explore what the factory pattern is and how we can apply it in React. Now, if you search up online the factory pattern, nine out of 10 times, the definition will revolve around OOP. And you may find something along the lines of, the factory pattern is a design pattern that allows creating objects of different types without exposing the instantiation logic to the client. Now, this is an excellent definition as it accurately encapsulates the essence of the factory pattern. However, we must be more general, as all of the design patterns you encounter, realistically speaking, will not be specific to a particular paradigm, such as OOP. In fact, they can be employed in pretty much everything. So, in simple terms, the factory pattern is a method of creating things without the need for manual labor each time. That said, so, in other words, let's say you have to create different types of shapes, such as circles, squares, or triangles. Instead of you manually specifying the parameters and methods for each shape every time you need one, you can just create a function that takes in the type of the shape, so create shape, takes in type, and returns the object of that type with the appropriate data. Now here you might be wondering, isn't that what classes are for? You can just create a class and you instantiate it, passing different inputs every time, and now you have your own factory. And that's true, but not quite. Classes are used to create a single entity, while with the factory pattern, you return multiple entities, sometimes even completely different entities. And you abstract away all of that creation logic into a self-contained function that internally decides what to give back to you based on the input. That's what the factory pattern is. Well, these definitions are nice, but it's best to see them in action. So suppose you want to render inputs based off a JSON schema, similar to how Google Form works, where the user fills out the structure of their survey and then that structure gets stored in a database, which is most likely using the JSON format. And then when someone opens up the survey, the client will get the data and it is going to render the necessary inputs. So to achieve that, you should use the factory pattern. So to demonstrate, here I have this text area and if I pass in this structure, so we want an input of type string, the label must be name, placeholder, enter your name, it must be required, then the length minimum one, maximum 100, and the default value is this one. So we pass this in an array, and each object represents each input. And then if I click on submit, as we can see the form is rendered. So we have name, it is required, and we have the default value, and then the submit button. And then when the user submits, they get the data here. So this is how Google Form works in essence. As a side note, if you would be interested in building out a Google Forms clone, let me know in the comment section. Anyway, how did I achieve this? Well, if I come here to the root page, I declared this state, so the schema. And this is either the JSON schema, so the one that you pass in, or null and the null represents the initial state. So if this is the first time loading the page, you're obviously not going to have a schema yet. So this will be null for the time being. But what is this JSON schema type? Well, as we can see, it is a union. So we have the possible properties for an input of type string, which is the one that we just tested out. So we have minimum and maximum, which are optional, we have the label placeholder, required, and default value, which is also optional. So if I come here to this type, as we can see, we're using SOD for the validation. So if I scroll up, we have the text input schema. So the type must be string, so it is a literal. Then we have the minimum and maximum, optional, and then we have this refine that makes sure that if you set a minimum and a maximum, the maximum must be greater than the minimum, logically. Then we have the number input schema. So this is for an input of type number. So it just has the minimum, maximum. This time we're not validating that it is between a valid range, but we can add that later on. And we have default value and required, pretty much the same as this one. 
And then we have the Boolean input schema. So this one has less properties, just a default value required and the ID. And then we have the select input schema. So you can pass in options, which must be an array of objects where you have the label, which is the text that will be shown in each option and the actual value. The required label, the type, which is select, and then the default value, which of course must correspond to this one, which we're doing here. So refine and we make sure that the default value is within the options that you pass in. Because if the default value doesn't exist in the options, then it is not a valid value. So we say default value must be a valid value from options. And then we have the whole input schema, which now that I think about it, we can improve this name. This should be form schema instead of input schema, but it doesn't really matter since this is a sample project. Then we have the JSON schema. So the data we can actually pass here. So the structure of this must be an array of the union of all of the different inputs you can define and minimum one. So if I pass in an empty array, as we can see, invalid schema, array must contain at least one element. And so with this, we can extract the type like this. And this is in fact what the factory form is going to render out based off this JSON schema. So that's why in the root page, we can set the schema here. Now, all we're doing here is render a form. We have the text area with the ID schema and then button type submit. And then once the user has selected a schema, so it's different from null, then we render the factory form and we pass in that schema. So once submit for this form, so the page doesn't get refreshed, then we get the value. So we're not controlling the input value. We're getting it here in this callback. So we get the form here and then we target the elements, which in other words is a collection of all controls in a given form. And then we retrieve the schema text area via named item. So returns the item with ID or name from the collection. And we know this can be either the HTML text area element or null if it doesn't exist. So we're being safe here, even though we have defined it here, we still want to make sure that it is not a null. And then we get the value. So optional chaining, which is going to return to us either the value or undefined. So as we can see values of type string or undefined, and then we validate that it is not undefined. So the user has actually typed in something. Then we validate the data. So we need to make sure that it is in actually JSON format. So I created this function called isValidJSON, which returns a discriminated union, meaning that it switches upon a property. So when it is success, so true, then we get access to the data, which is unknown. And that makes sense since we cannot guarantee that the user has typed in in the format that we expect it to, or we get success false and then the error, which is a string. So if I come here to the implementation, we're simply using the json.parse, and this is going to throw an error if it's invalid. So we catch it and we check what type of error, syntax error or type error. And if so, we access the message property. Otherwise, it is an unknown error which I believe shouldn't happen, but it's best to be safe. So this line, and well, in the case it doesn't throw an error, we just return the data and success to be true. That way we can say if not result that success, then we get access to the error property. So again, we're using discriminated unions. So if I say result dot success, as you can see, I cannot access either the error or data at this point. But if I check if success is true, then I get access to data, which is of type unknown. Otherwise, I get access to the error. So this is really nice. So if all of this is valid, then we can actually parse against the JSON schema. So this one right here, an array of all of the form schemas. So we use safe parse, we pass in the data, which we know is unknown. And at this point, if this is successful, so the function doesn't bail out at this point, the data is in the structure we actually wanted. So as you can see, all of this is completely type safe from TypeScript compilation to even the runtime. 
by leveraging SOD. And well, of course, if this schema is not valid, we just log or alert to the window the errors. But what about the factory form itself? How did I achieve that? Well, if I come here to this component, we accept the schema. And if I scroll down to the actual logic for rendering the form, as you can see, we're mapping over the fields and we switch upon them. So for the case where it is a string and a number, we return the input. For the case that it is a Boolean, we return an input, but this time of type checkbox. In the case that it is select, we render a select. Now you may be wondering about these components since they are custom and not the native components. And that is because they are just wrappers for the native components. All I did was style them so it looks pretty. But the select again is just the select. So nothing fancy here. And then we render the options. And if the value we passed in doesn't correspond to any of these ones, then we just return null. And then we have the submit button. And as for the logic for the unchange, as we can see here, well, if I come here to this function, we take in the ID of the input and the type of the input. So in the case it is number, then we get the value as number. So we know that the target is HTML input element. In the case that it is Boolean, it's the same, but we get access to checked. And in any other case, we know that it is just event.target.value. And then finally, we have this set form state. We spread over the previous state, and then we find that state where the changed value corresponds to that input. And then we replace the value altogether with the new one, of course. As you can see, this just returns a function. So here, when we have the handle change, we pass in the ID of the field, the type of the field, and then this is going to return the actual unchange handler. So nothing too complex here. And as for the form state, since the user can provide default values, then all we do here is reduce them. So the initial state will be an object where the key is the ID of the field and the value is the default value. If there is no default value, we never assign that key. So as we can see here, we reduce it. We see if the default value is different from undefined. And if so, we assign at the object at a field.id the default value. And if this is not true, we do not do anything other than return the accumulator. So this is how you can use the factory pattern. As you can see, you're not going to manually type everything out. Suppose this is not a Google Forms, where it is dynamic, in the sense that any user can create a unique combination of different inputs, but rather it is a dashboard, and you have a lot of pages, one to modify users, the other for products, and you may have hundreds of forms. Sometimes it is very time consuming and not maintainable to have a hundred pages and for each one, you manually type out the form. So you type out the inputs, the labels, everything. For that, you can leverage the factory pattern. And instead, you can create this abstracted factory that is going to take in a JSON schema. And based off that JSON schema, it is going to render in the UI the corresponding form. So instead of you manually typing out the structure of the form over a hundred times, all you do is open up a JSON file like this one, modify or add new fields, and then you can call it a day. As you know, it is going to be dynamically rendered by this factory, saving you a lot of time. So now let's take a look at a more complex form. So if I copy all of this and then paste it here, submit, as we can see, we have way more properties. So we have the name, we have the age, we have a checkbox, subscribe to newsletter. Don't mind these tiles here. We have the gender, so a select, male, female, or other. And then you have the email, and you have accept terms and conditions. And if I submit this, as we can see, we get all of the data we need. As for the validation, this is all in the client side. So if I remove the email, and then submit the form, as you can see, we get please fill out this field. And this is not done with JavaScript, but rather the native HTML validation. 
So remember, you can just come here and say that an input is required. And by doing that, your browser via HTML will make sure that you filled out that input. Now, of course, you wouldn't treat the client as the single source of truth for the data the user sends in. You would validate this in the server as well to make sure that no one circumvents some particular requirement. So you would do an extra validation in your server before submitting that info in a database, for example. Anyway, as you can see, this is how you can leverage the factory pattern and simplify your code. So remember, the factory pattern is simply a way so you can avoid code duplication whenever you need to generate some output. So now this concludes the video. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to subscribe and like the video. I'll see you in the next one.